as you know, we have been discussing about uh, the concept of dualism in philosophy of mind. In the last class, we did talk about Sal's criticism of uh, substance dualism advocated by Descartes. Today, we will be discussing about dualism. There are two points that I am going to discuss today. One is about argument for dualism, how dualism sustains in you know um, in philosophy and how it has been sustaining rather in philosophy. And the second point that I am going to discuss is about property dualism. In fact, when I talked about Searle's uh, argument against Descartes uh, substance dualism, I did mention about this term called property dualism. Searle has been criticized for advocating property dualism or Searle's philosophy of mind is been defined as a property dualism. Now, today I will start with uh, the concept of uh, property dualism. Now, particularly uh, today's lecture will have reference to Paul Churchland's uh, work on matter and consciousness. Uh, this work was published in uh, 1984 and the revised edition came out uh, in 1987 by MIT Press. So, today let us see what is property dualism. We would also uh, come back to this idea that whether Searle is a property dualist at all, because when Searle talks about um, the concept of mind, he says that the mind is uh, an irreducible phenomenon. It is uh, not only irreducible, but also uh, its properties are irreducible. So, mind has different properties. So, consciousness uh, that is uh, irreducible to mental to the brain processes is something very significant. Uh, similarly, the other properties like intentionality, subjectivity etcetera will also say are this feature of irreducibility. So, let us go to this idea of a property dualism of what Churchland talks about, how briefly he defines this notion of property dualism. He says the brain has a special sort of properties possessed by no other kind of physical object. It is this special properties that are non physical. So, we have physical properties and also we have mental properties like physical properties are fundamental to the physical objects and the explanation of physical objects. Similarly, mental properties are essential for the explanation of mental phenomenon. So, for example, when I am having pain, pain is a sensation and this sensation would also have some other mental states like desire to get rid of um, sensation desire to get rid of the pain that I am suffering. So, this desire is a mental state. Now, mental states have properties um, according to Searle. Let us find that how Searle defines this properties. He says intentionality is one of the properties. He says all mental states are intentional by nature. By intentional he means that they are directed towards something in the world. So, this directedness is a feature of the mental state. Now, if intentionality is a feature, then intentionality is a mental feature and that is what is very important for sir, for a property dualist that there are certain features which are exclusively mental. So, for example, in the case of a physical object mass waves are certain important properties essential properties through which we explain the physical objects. Property dualist would talk about the existence of the mental as well as the existence of the physical. So, the non physical or the mental is something which is to be explained exclusively in terms of certain mental properties. Now, do property dualists talk about mind 
as a reality that is the questions. Now, when we talk about property dualism, we go back to this idea of uh, reality of mind precisely because there are some property dualists who do not accept the existence of mind. So, the reality of mind is questioned in fact, within the theoretical framework of property dualism, because the hypothesis is that the mind is emerging out of certain brain processes. Now, when the brain process was to certain level of complexity, then this complexity or the complex function of the brain gives birth to mind. So, mind is, is emerged as a phenomenon out of the brain processes. In, in that sense, mind is, is a causal product of the brain processes. Now, if this idea is correct, if this thesis is correct, then the question is whether mind is reducible to the brain processes. Now, property dualist would argue that mind is reducible to brain processes. Say some of the property dualist would argue that mind is reducible to brain processes, meaning thereby since mind is caused by brain processes, mind can be reduced to the brain processes in the sense that mind is ex causally explainable in terms of the functions of the brain. Now, if mind is causally explainable in terms of the brain processes, the question is whether there is mind at all. This question is valid for a property dualist who is also known as an epiphenomenalist. Now, epiphenomenon is not a very new term, this has been there in the, in the Greek. Let us see when we talk about epiphenomenon in the Greek we say that it is above. So, the mind is above the brain processes. Now, certain level of complexity of the brain processes causes mind. Now, mental phenomena are caused to occur by various activities of the brain, they do not have the causal effects in turn. When mental is caused, then what is its ontological status? That is the question. Now, whether it can uh, in turn be explained by the brain processes. Some property dualists would argue that they can be explained by the brain processes. Hence, so the idea of mind is an illusion. Now, the other idea is that which talks about some kind of interaction between the mind and the brain. That is that I have a desire, I have intention and when we this desire and intentions, beliefs etcetera have function, they cause certain actions. So, for example, desire to get rid of pain will cause that I must go to the doctor, I must consult the physician for you know for this pain. Now, this decision to you know going to a doctor and you know getting consulted and getting rid of this pain is something very interesting. So, so there are mental phenomena which are causing action and so there is a kind of a interaction between the mind and the body. Okay. So, uh, this kind of interaction will, will presuppose that mind is something real, something there. But for the property dualist, mind and, and body at physical movements and thoughts are real. But for an epiphenomenalist, mind is not a reality, mind is an illusion. So, epiphenomenalist will say that the very impression of the mind that is caused by brain processes is an illusory phenomenon, it is not a reality at all. Now, to be real, it should have certain causal power. A phenomenon is real if and only if it can bring some effect in the reality in the world and that is how we consider something is real and something is unreal. An illusory phenomenon 
cannot cause any effect. So, therefore, mind is causally inefficacious to cause an effect. So, what is in fact causing an effect is the brain. So, the brain activities are causing physical movements, it is the brain activities which are you now uh, causing my action, my action to visit the doctor or consult the physician to get rid of the pain. Now, all these actions, decisions, uh, judgments, etcetera are in fact caused by the brain activities. So, the impression of the mind is indeed considered as an epiphenomenon. So, this idea of or this notion of mind is known as epiphenomenalism and now the question is whether Searle commits uh, to the very idea of uh, epiphenomenalism, the th theory of epiphenomenalism is something to be discussed probably in some of the other classes. What is important to note here is that when Searle gives his hypothesis that mind is caused by brain processes and realized in brain processes, Searle is certainly talking about some kind of a causal interaction between the brain and the mind. So, this causal interaction does not hold the causal reductionism, it, it does not hold any kind of reductionism for that matter. So, uh, Searle is therefore, a property dualist. Searle does not accept an emergent notion of mind, we will discuss about it. How does Searle refute some of the emergentists like say for example, Jürgen Kim who is a strong advocate of emergentism in contemporary uh, philosophy of mind. Kim argues that mind is caused by uh, brain processes and mind is has a causal relationship with uh, brain processes but this causal relation is not uh, in fact the kind of causal relationship which we are talking about in the first case of emergence. That say for example, when we talk about the body or say for example, the brain then mind is emerging out of this brain, it is kind of a it is the first you know, level of uh, causation. Now, this is accepted to Kim, but what is not accepted to Kim probably some kind of a causal uh, know, interaction where mind is is considered as something causally real as the potentiality to interact or intervene in the case of the bodily behaviors. So, that kind of significance is not attributed to uh, the concept of mind in the case of Kim. So, we will come back to this idea of where Searle is critiquing uh, Kim's notion of emergentism and there is something good about emergentism, talk about some kind of a parallelism, we will look at this uh, notion of parallelism, how parallelism is historically uh, advocated by say uh, Leibniz or you know, many others, we will come back to that. Now, let us look at the kind of a dilemma which uh, property dualism poses. At one point, we find that uh, there is you know a brain which is causing behavior, the origination of the behavior and the brain is something which is controlling all our behaviors. So, behaviors are controlled by certain function of the brain. Okay. So, and there are uh, you know the brain is a kind of a uh, complex system and this complex systems have various mechanisms and neuroscience tells us how the brain functions happen, different brain functions happen at a different point of time and how complex it is when we talk about explanation of a, a particular behavior. So, brain as a whole is, uh, is something very important so far as human uh, behavior is concerned. Now, if that is true then it you know uh, it does not fit 
with the other part. The other part is the testimony of introspections and the desire, intention, volitions, etc., are been felt. I am introspecting that yes, these are there. I experience that yes, I this is my desire. I'm I had to rush to the doctor. Now I need to consult the doctor, and I believe that there is somebody called a doctor. So desire, belief, and my intention to get rid of this pain is are all connected. So all these mental states are in fact felt. When I introspect, I am aware of or I am experiencing these mental states. So experience is not denied. Similarly, the brain is causing different behaviors, different movements and different uh, processes are involved in causing a particular behavior is also significant. So, property dualists are the dualist who accept some kind of interaction between the brain and the mind, but some of them do not accept that mind is real. Some of them accept that both mind and the brain are real. Searle belongs to this category who argues that mind is irreducible to the brain processes. Now, what is this irreducibility? Irreducibility, let us briefly put it in this way that mind cannot be causally explained by the function of the brain processes. So, once it is explained, we say that it has been reduced, because when we talk about the explanation in the case of material bodies, we do find that material bodies function in a particular way. So, the mechanism that is involved in the function of this material body is certainly explained by the causal laws. So, causal laws or causal explanation is possible in the case of explaining the different functions, the complex function of a material body, a material object and how this the body interacts with the, the world, how this interaction brings about changes in the world. So, and that determines the causal efficacy of a material object or causal efficacy of a phenomenon. But if we say that mind is not real, we mean that mind is causally important, it is causally inefficacious to make that impact to bring about any change in the case of the material body. So, so property dualist, some property dualist are epiphenomenalist, some property dualist are still dualist, but of course, they are not dualist in the Cartesian sense of the term dualism, where say for example, the Descartes official theory advocates that mind and body are two substances. So, property dualist certainly do not accept this argument of substance dualism and I think we have discussed about it you know how Searle refutes substance dualism in our previous classes. And we have also discussed the criticism of Gilbert Ryle against this official doctrine of substance dualism. I will come back to Ryle little later, but let us talk about uh, this interactionist property dualism. One which says the irreducibility of the mental phenomena uh, on the one hand and the fundamental properties of the physical on the other hand are considered as something very important. So, there is a kind of a dualism which prevails, okay, whether it is in the sense of property dualism or it is in the sense of uh, substance dualism, dualism prevails. Now, why dualism prevails? What are the reasons for considering dualism is something very significant, which is the other part which 
I, as I mentioned earlier that I will be discussing about this. Now, uh, the religious considerations, Churchland man, maintains that religious consideration is, is something very fundamental uh, adhere to now the, the dualistic ideas that the commitment to uh, know, this view that mind is real and the commitment to this uh, assumption that there is an immortality of soul. As you know, this term soul appears in meditation again and again. So, people have been uh, talking about it, whether soul is identical with mind or soul is uh, different from the mind. In Indian traditions, we consider soul is uh, something different from the mind. A mind is an indriya, is one of the sense organs, whereas in the western tradition, you find mind and soul are identical. In, in Indian context, when you say mind manas is an indriya, we never associate it with, with the mind or the soul. Soul is, is a kind of a you know, witness consciousness, it is a kind of a sakhi, okay, as an observer. Okay who which is observing all the activities of the person of the mind and the, the body or the person as a whole. So, that kind of you know, difference is there, but when we talk about Descartes, when we talk about Descartes dualism, we look at it from the western point of view. Now, the, in the western tradition in the classical uh, text soul is the term soul is mentioned. In the recent text, we find the term mind is mentioned and they are sometimes interchangeably used. Now, when we talk about cognition or cognitive, the science of cognition, we do talk about the another term called intelligence. Now, some people identify, say for example, for George learned intelligence is, is something very significant, it can replace the concept of mind and intelligence can be physically produced. So, Churchland's computational uh, theory of mind you know, um, is one of the very significant contribution to uh, the understanding of mind. Um, I am sure Professor Nath will be discussing about the computational theory of mind in his lectures. Now, let us look at our point, uh, the point about the religious commitment of a person. When a person is religiously committed to this idea that there is a soul and this soul is immortal and that is is problematic one in the sense that if that belief is acceptable proposition to a person, then he would say that it is the body which dies, it is the body which is, is there but it is not that significant. So, they accept the existence of body at the same time they accept the existence of the mind. Now, when we talk about the origin of the universe in, in, in a religious context, we do say that you know the God has created the universe. Now, this very idea of God is, is pure consciousness or the idea of an unmoved mover in Aristotle talks about a kind of intelligent mind who has designed the universe. Look at Aristotelian uh, no, notion of causality. In Aristotelian notion of causality, uh, you will find that there is a notion of efficient cause. Now, who is an efficient cause? The efficient cause is an agent, it is the agent who has the power to bring about change in the matter. Okay. It affects the stuff, the basic stuff that is the material body and it brings out something, okay. it designs something. So, the, the presence of an efficient cause, I am sure you know Aristotle's four kinds of causes, the material cause, the efficient cause, the formal cause and the final cause. Now, all four causes are important when we talk about the explanation of a particular phenomenon. 
Similarly, when Aristotle talks about the existence of an unmoved mover, Aristotle is referring to a kind of an universal agent and the agent who has been the creator of this universe. So, the creator he is the cause of uh, universe and Descartes does talk about this first cause. Okay. If now Descartes look at Descartes example of a person who is working you know, in the desert and he finds that there is the words lying okay. and what is the idea comes to his mind probably you know, there is a watchmaker. So, who is this maker? Is he an intelligent being or is he an intelligent being is something you know to be considered significantly. So, Descartes acceptance to the religious understanding of the mind is not completely deniable. He accepts that there is a soul and the soul has kind of a is a spiritual entity. So, the, the spiritual attribute is something you know significant in the case of uh, Descartes understanding of the concept of mind or the soul. So, a religious uh, person would look at the creation of the universe from a creator's perspective. So, creationist as you know talk about the creator and God is the creator of the universe okay. and God is a kind of spiritual being, God is a non physical being. Okay. Now, the so non physical being exists is something you know is seriously argued by the dualist because dualist believe that there is a non physical being. Now, if there is a non physical being then what is its position in the universe? If there is a creator then what is its position in the universe? That is something significant. How he is been located in the universe? That question will be you know very significant. Now, let us go back to the next point that Descartes or a dualist would like to make the argument from introspection. So, first argument was argument from a religious point of view, the second work argument is argument from introspection. Now, the center of our attention on the content of consciousness is something important. We do talk about neural functions, we do talk about how you know there is a electromagnetic waves are generated when the brain is functioning but we are also aware of the thoughts which are there in our mind. We are aware of our experiences, feelings etcetera and this awareness comes through some kind of a reflection. So, consciousness is reflexive in nature human mind is reflexive in nature. It is not that it is I am just conscious of things that whatever I am seeing, I am seeing all of you are there and you know listening carefully to my lectures like that, but I am also thinking of what I am saying, I am aware of what I am saying. Now, this kind of awareness is called self reflection. Now, if I go back to my office and think whether think about this class, I feel oh, this class was really horrible, I could not deliver what I was intending to deliver in the class. Now, in that sense I am talking about my self consciousness, I am reflecting on whatever I said in the class and what I was supposed to tell uh, in the lecture. Now, when I evaluate all this I am 
really interrogating myself, I am really questioning myself, I am reflecting on myself. So, this kind of you know, attitude of the self, attitude of the being, the attitude of the mind is something according to Descartes is introspection. Mind has this ability to introspect you know, what it you know, what it has. So, this, this is something you know, very important argument according to Descartes or uh, a dualist um, who believes that mind and body are real. He cannot just say that there is no mind like an epiphenomenalist argues that there is no mind. Now, how can I eliminate this idea that I am not experiencing at all? I am not aware of what I said in the class. How do I say that? Now, if somebody is uh, saying that there is nothing called mind, uh, there is nothing called feelings, experiences and so on, then probably he is a physicalist, he is a materialist, he is not a dualist. So, a dualist consideration will be something different. He would accept that there is a body, that is, there are brain processes happening, okay. brain processes have all the physical properties. Say for example, there are chemical secretions in the brain corresponding to a particular uh, feeling, uh, there is a chemical uh, wavelength to my a particular thought or to a particular action. Now, all these are reality. So, physico chemical processes are happening in the brain is a reality corresponding to a particular thought or a particular sensation or a feeling. Now, that is not deniable. At the same time, what is not deniable is that there exist mental states or thoughts or experiences. Now, I have also talked about another argument which uh, is raised by George Lind, the argument of irreducibility. I have, I have said what irreducibility is all about. Now, human ability, ability to have mental phenomena, okay, ability to possess mental phenomena is something very significant. Okay. And this significant feature is not causally explained by the behavior of the brains. Now, similarly, you have human beings have the ability to articulate uh, expressions, articulate thoughts, put them in words. So, the linguistic ability of the being is something very significant. So, how does one articulate a particular thought? Okay. So, the linguistic ability according to Churchland is something very significant. Now, whether uh, we can really explain the, our ability, linguistic ability at all, that we will be discussing little later. Similarly, how do we rationalize thoughts? Is reason a kind of a essential feature of the mind? Descartes would say that reason is an essential feature of mind. Imagination is an essential feature of mind. Reason and imaginations are higher order consciousness, whereas sensibility, feeling is a lower order consciousness. In, in meditation, you will find that Descartes is talking about imagination and reason, and he puts them at, at a very higher level. Now, because human being is a rational being, human being is an imaginative being. Now, he imagines. Now, in imagination, we create things. So, human creativity is fundamentally, you know, grounded on human imagination. Now, the faculty of imagination or the faculty of reasoning is essentially features of human consciousness. Now, so this is irreducible, this is undeniable. Now, the other aspect of a human consciousness, which talks about subjectivity or qualia with reference to Searle's criticism of uh, Descartes. I said 
that there are four uh, features which are it to be explained away and that is what can retain dualism further and these four features are consciousness, intentionality, subjectivity and mental causation. Now, these four uh, things are very important. Now, when we talk about subjectivity, we talk about the first person's experience of a particular thing or things in the world. So, when I look at you, I look at it from my point of view. When you are looking at me, when you are listening to me and trying to understand what I am saying, you are looking at from your point of view. So, for instance, a poet is looking at the clouds and a meteorologist looking at the cloud, they are looking at from two different point of views. One who is trying to imagine a case of a beauty, another who is trying to predict the weather, the weather conditions. So, poet and meteorologist will look at the same reality from two different perspectives. So, according to Sir, who is a property dualist, let us accept Searle as a property dualist for our understanding, we will debate whether he is really a property dualist or not in our you know, future classes. Now, who is a property dualist, he argues that all consciousness is perspectival, because we look at the world from a subject's point of view, where all subjects and we are looking at the world, we are experiencing the world from our own point of view. Hence, consciousness is perspectival. So, perspectival is a feature of consciousness like intentionality and that is what is subjective. Subjective in the sense that it is from a first person's point of view. In the case of you know such experience is absent in the case of you know case of others. You do not have it, rather I have it and what you have I do not have it. So, from that point of view we can look at you know the notion of subjectivity. There is of course, we do share our experiences that is there, we do communicate our experiences, feelings, contents of thoughts etcetera that is fairly understood, but what is important here is this that I experience things from my own point of view and when I represent that experience, I represent it from a particular perspective. So, when I say that it is perspectival, there is a semantic content in it, there is a meaning embedded in it. So, when I say something, I make it meaningful to you. So, a meaningful representation would show how my thought is perspectival and how do I look at it. From that point of view, we can say that consciousness is subjective or it has some kind of a qualia or a phenomenal property and that would suggest that consciousness is real. There is another argument which Churchland is putting, that argument is argument from parapsychology. Now, let us look at this, what are the features uh, which are considered meaningful in the discourse of parapsychology. One is telepathy, pre-recognition, telekinesis and clairvoyance. Now, all these features are considered very significant. When you talk about telepathy, we talk about mind reading. When you talk about precognition, we talk about how does an individual look at his future, talks about future, okay. clairvoyance, knowledge about distinct objects. Now, these above phenomena are real and existing in a super physical nature. So, parapsychology talks about another level of the mental, where mental is considered is real. So, we do talk about pre recognitions, we do talk about telepathy in our everyday life and all this have some kind of a cultural you know root 
they are culturally rooted in our everyday life. That is what is I think would give a uh, no clue uh, to understand that there is something called mind. It is not just an ordinary introspection, rather at another level mind is real, mind is realizable and there are so many uh, no, um, psychologists who deal with uh, parapsychology very systematically and um, there is one branch of psychology which talks about parapsychology. Um, let us uh, do not debate on what whether parapsychology is right or wrong or whether it, uh, um, it is just an hypothesis, but let us accept this proposition that telepathy, clairvoyance etcetera are having a, some kind of a cultural basis, a religious point of view are discussed from the perspective of human society. So, in the society there are different cultures and different cultures define human mind in many different ways. So, that is what is significant. So, our overall considerations are very general. So, you have a scientific credentials of the religions and their religious authority is questioned. So, on the one hand and this religious authorities who are questioned, we also question that there is a kind of a, a reality or the universe which is not been created, whether it is evolved. Okay. This you know uh, we have already seen in the Ranasa or in the introduction as I mentioned that how geocentric view was rejected and heliocentric view was accepted and Galileo Copernicus view about the origin of the universe is something very significant. And I think it is important to look at the origin of the universe question from that point of view, where what is the air at the at the center is not the earth, rather it is the sun which is at the center and the earth including other planets are revolving around the sun. And so, this uh, idea between Ptolemy and Copernicus was is meaningfully proved by Galileo's Galileo's theory of uh, light was a, a significant scientific contribution to understand how creationist notion of the universe is insignificant. So science would always look at the mind from a different point of view, and religious or religious understanding of the mind will give a different pictures. So, the overall consideration is that there are micro elements, there are micro elements which constitutes the matter or a physical body and the physical body you know, has this energy, has the power to bring about change in the world. So, uh, there is always a constant battle between science and religion and science in the renaissance we found that how science has succeeded and how science has proved that many things are real. Now, this understanding of religious rationality, how do rationality of religions you know, give this conviction look at idea um, that there are different religions and all as I said when we talk about the mind, when we talk about uh, the mind has a, has a cultural root. Okay. I particularly think that there are many religions. Okay. Buddhism is there in the Orient, Islam is spread in Africa and Middle East, Hinduism in India and Christianity in mostly in the, okay. sorry this is a spelling mistake here, uh, Europe and America. So, you will find that they are all having a kind of different you know, outlook about the religious understanding of the world. So, the religious understanding of the world is different from the scientific understanding of the world and there is a conflict between the two, there is always a tension between the two. And as a philosopher what we would really try to do is to find out a comfort zone, to find out 
where we can make a critical contribution, contribution to the understanding of the reality. So, that is what is philosophers of. I think I have discussed about what philosophy does and what is philosophical knowledge all about in the, my introductory classes. If you remember, we will our whole approach is to look at things whether it is religion, whether it is science, whether it is religious explanation or scientific explanation, we try to locate these explanations more critically and our, our systematic criticism will help us to grasp the reality and it will generate new debates, new discussions etcetera, etcetera that will contribute certainly in the growth of uh, knowledge. So, philosophical uh, endeavor is, uh, is different. So, what is more important is that how rationally we can you know um, question the religious attitudes and how rationally we can pursue science for the systematic um, development of knowledge. Now, if we only accept the religious understanding of the mind probably we will be doomed to you know a spiritualistic world and we will forget you know the success of science and uh, the success stories of science are certainly meaningful they are very productive uh, real so far as our day to day life is concerned. So, we cannot deny such a realism and jump into the religious conclusions, but when we accept this these two point of views, when we accept that these are the realities, then we have to accept dualism. So, dualism whether it is substance dualism or property dualism they remain they remain with us if we hold on to two perspectives the religious perspective of mind and the scientific perspective of mind. I will come back to the idea of uh, how scientific perspectives of mind can give better picture of the mind in my next class. Thank you.